So, uh, firstly, let me uh, welcome all of you to the third and final session in this mini series of THE HR webinars. Uh, this one titled uh, Onboarding in MENA in COVID 19. I'm Nick Davis, Hiring Solutions Director here at Times Higher Education. Uh, and first off, a huge thank you to everyone who's joined us today, and uh, particularly those of you who have joined us for other sessions as well. We've seen a, a really a fantastic response to this series over the past three weeks with hundreds of registrants from dozens of different countries and institutions, both within MENA uh, and from be, uh, the regions beyond. So the series, which so far has included sessions on faculty recruitment and legal hazards during the pandemic, was imagined and brought to life through conversations we held with our partners back in March and April of this year as the global threat of COVID-19 became more and more apparent, as universities began the tra to transition faculty and staff to remote working, as little used terms like blended learning became part of the common vernacular, uh, and as we all fell afoul of Zoom bombing, uh, one critical question from our partners was how should they be approaching onboarding during the coronavirus pandemic? And that meant how do they pivot from physical to digital onboarding, how do they bring someone into their organisational culture in a digital environment? Uh, and what tools and training will their new recruits need to work in this new world? We are a couple of months further along now, uh, and hopefully a couple of months wiser. And to help me answer some of these questions, I've convened some, uh, some leading lights uh, in the field of onboarding uh, in HE and from the private sector to come and share their experience. I'll be quizzing them shortly, but we would also love to have some questions from you guys on the floor as well. So please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Send them through throughout the session. Don't feel you have to wait until the end. Uh, and I will make sure we pose those questions to our panel as well. So to that said panel, first of all, to my left as I'm seeing it, uh, we have Susan Abushakra, uh, Manager of Faculty Affairs at KAUST. Uh, Susan has been leading a team of professionals in the Office of Faculty Affairs at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology for the past seven years. She supports and advises the Vice President for Academic Affairs in leading many key faculty related functions and matters such as faculty recruitment and orientation, annual faculty evaluation, promotion and faculty development. Susan has worked at the University of Toronto in different capacities uh, with the latest being in the office of the Vice Provost for Faculty and Academic Life as a Faculty Affairs Coordinator. Susan holds a Master's in Education in Theory and Policy Studies of Higher Education from the University of Toronto and she is currently pursuing a graduate degree in Institutional Research at Penn State University. Next up we have Umar Zaman, uh, Director of Human Resources and Organisational Development at Sheffield Hallam University. Umar is the director of HR and OD Directorate in one of the UK's largest universities. It's focused on shaping the people, diversity, staff engagement, OD, talent management, payroll, pensions, all across the university. So just a, a small remit there, Umar. Uh, he is an accomplished and focused HR and OD leader with a passion for developing and executing strategic and operational HR diversity and OD strategies. Umar's career varies from being an advisor to the Home Secretary and Ministers to leading various large-scale national projects in the field of HIOD, diversity and inclusion and transformational change. Thanks very much for joining us, Amar. And finally, we have Andy Smither, a Global Onboarding Senior Manager for UK and Ireland and EMEA at Salesforce. Uh, so Andy uh, leads all elements of employee onboarding across the UK, Ireland and EMEA for one of Forbes's world's most innovative companies. His team of employee focused culture champions ensures every new employee is set up for success and is warmly welcomed into, and I'm going to get him to talk about this later on, warmly welcomed into Salesforce Oana, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. He is driven by helping others to succeed and does so by listening, discovering and sharing. Uh, and uh, the first two is certainly what I'm going to be doing most of this afternoon, I hope, listening and discovering as I let you guys really take the floor. So, Susan, I'm going to come to you first. 
uh, we're talking about onboarding. How quickly did you make the transition from in-person to digital onboarding? Okay, hi everyone, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I just want to give a little bit of a synopsis about KAUS. KAUS is uh, very unique because it's a graduate research university in, a, in Saudi Arabia. So we live in a compound. So we have a community life along with the academic life. So basically, um, whoever moves to KAUS, they live on the compound and they teach and they work and they live. Kids go to school and everything there. So faculty hire and onboarding at CAUS is a multi-departmental or multi-unit undertaking and where several units are involved. So there's HR, faculty affairs, the divisions, there's the schools where the kids are going to go, there's the community to, to figure out housing. And given the setup of the university, onboarding is a huge thing, as we all know. And because on top of everything, it's moving to a new country, to a new community for the candidate and for the immediate family members. So as soon as the COVID-19 situation evolved, we recognized that we had to look at our contingency plan immediately and act very fast uh, on two aspects, on hiring and onboarding. So I'll be talking today about hiring and onboarding faculty specifically. Um, in terms of hiring, we did not reduce or suspend any of our activity. We kept going at the same pace. In terms of onboarding, um, which we will focus on today, and namely faculty onboarding, we all know that effective onboarding enhances engagement and increases retention levels. So, so to keep our faculty candidates engaged and interested, we had to act fast. We had to uh, be creative and, and we had to come up with like bridging contracts because they've left the positions they were in, uh, in their previous institutions, and they were waiting to board, and then suddenly COVID hit, and on top of everything, to a new job was topped up with, uh, oh my God, there's the, the challenges in traveling, there's the challenge in, in coming to a new community, in, in social distancing, travel restrictions, all of that. The labs shut down, um, the move to online teaching, how are we going to address all of that? So HR um, did propose bridging contracts, which we basically honored our contracts with the faculty who signed up with us and couldn't come yet. So we worked some form of a bridging contract with them and we started doing some of the work there. But along the way, uh, we, we made sure all the units were involved and that all the new hires will have access to the, all the information needed via virtual orientation, via remote access, you know, they needed usernames, they needed emails, they needed shared folders. So there was a lot of work being done among this all divisions in terms of this. So we had to act quickly, immediately, and it was a very successful thing because all the units worked together. Fantastic. Andy, you were nodding away throughout there. Is it a similar story at Salesforce? Was it an interdepartmental thing or was it all you? Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting question. Uh, welcome everyone to the call. I, I remember with a, a sense of panic, uh, what is now a number of months ago, when I think going back, it was Italy actually, who were the first, one of the first countries to go into lockdown. And we had to really think about how we were going to repurpose uh, the experience for our, for our new hires over there. And so we had to ultimately work out, Salesforce is a, a customer relationship management company, first and foremost, and we live, we were born in the cloud. And so we are very fortunate in that a lot of our resources are online anyway. But one of the problems we would have is how do we make sure that we are equipping our new hires with the technology and the equipment to actually be able to, to work and be productive. Um, and so that was one of our key challenges to begin with. How do we just make sure that first and foremost, that they are able to get on with the work that they have signed up for, whilst also giving them a, an experience that is engaging, an experience that makes them, that, that helps them to validate that the, the choice that they made in leaving their previous organization was the correct one in joining Salesforce mm. as well. So there was a lot of work that we had to do with our communications teams on, you know, how do we make sure that we communicate sensitively and perhaps over communicate to our new hires about exactly what is going to be happening for them personally? How do we communicate with their managers? 
How do we communicate with the teams that are providing them with equipment? How do we communicate with our recruitment teams? There was endless amount of teams that we had to quickly uh, re, you know, renegotiate with and communicate with in the space of uh, what felt like two or three hours. It did feel to ha- like it happened overnight, didn't it? And Emma, is that, it was, was that the case for, for you guys at Sheffield Hallam uh, as well? You, did you come at it with a very operational mindset to start with or did you come at it in a different fashion? Um, I think, uh, well, welcome everybody. Um, I, I, I think in terms of what Andy's just said, that there was a element of panic. <laughs> uh, just generally, um, clearly it wasn't just staff we were looking at it was over 32,000 students as well as 6,000 staff so um, we did have a number of uh, people that were kind of stuck in the middle of of transferring into the organization Uh, so we had to quite very quickly within a matter of two weeks uh, went on to an online induction uh, program Um, my, my teams were incredibly hard to be able to do that uh, unlike yourself uh, and you know we we um, didn't have online um, uh, kind of induction uh, you know as a university you'd expect there's a lot of face-to-face interaction um, one of the things that we did uh, which we are going to continue doing is that um, each individual starter had an online induction with myself and the vice chancellor um, and that is actually something we're going to continue because actually whereas before you know they wouldn't get an interaction uh, with myself or the vice chancellor, they, they, we were talking to people from all kind of backgrounds coming into the organisation. So yeah, it, ha- it happened pretty quickly. Um, but to be, if I'm being very honest, we're still learning um, about it. You know, this is, we are in very difficult and um, unusual times. Unusual times uh, indeed, and I think this might just be me being a bit cheeky. What I want to know from these unusual times is. What's gone wrong? Have you got any incidences of where it's gone really, really wrong? And Andy, you know, let's say Salesforce were the, the most progressed prior to the, to, to the, the COVID uh, crisis um, in, in digital onboarding. Is there anything that you still struggled with? Any, anything that really went wrong? Well, uh, thank you for coming to me first. Um, <laughs> I, I was thinking about this question and I don't know that there was necessarily anything that we really regretted doing. One of the things though that we definitely did encounter that perhaps we, we hadn't thought about before was around data privacy. And so we had to be very careful, you know, in a world now where we're having to communicate with our, with our new employees via their personal email address and also via um, getting information around like what their home address is as well. So we could send their laptop to their home address as opposed to it being sent to a Salesforce office. So we were, we were kind of tripped up a little bit there in terms of, At first, we thought, okay, well, we can ask the hiring manager, for example, to ask certain questions. But then we we fell foul of that a little bit in understanding there's only certain types of people in certain teams who have certain privileges who can request data off individuals because it kind of sits under that whole kind of GDPR bucket. So that was definitely a learning curve for us. And that definitely it felt that some people such as the hiring managers felt like that that was really restricting to them Mm. because, you know, they were, they were really confused as to why we were saying that, you know, you can't send any Salesforce data to a person's private email address because essentially if that, if that equipment ever got stolen, then, and it has Salesforce data on there, Salesforce has no way of controlling that data or in the public domain, which is why we only ever allow people to have Salesforce data on Salesforce equipment. But that that was very frustrating for managers. And did you have to consult with Hillary Clinton on that or was that something you came to on your own? Not not personally, no. (laughs) Sorry, sorry. She may have have been in the background. (laughs) I told you I hadn't been working on my stand-up. Apologies. (laughs) Susan, um, or Amar, I think you you wanted to jump in on that. Any any instances of it really going wrong? Uh, Sorry, Susan, you go. Go ahead, Amar. 
No, you go, you go, please. I was going to say, in terms of faculty onboarding, um, we haven't faced any um, hurdles yet, but I'm sure that the longer we stay in this environment and in this, we are going to start to see more of it. So um, the first faculty member was supposed to join us in March and couldn't, and we breached his contract. Now, come September, he's going to be with us for about, what, four months, an employee of Kaos, but he's not at Kaos. So now I can see how the difficulty is going to start. And we're going to move from onboarding the faculty member to onboarding digitally his family. So what's going to happen to his kids who are supposed to join school? How are we going to bridge that? How are we going to, so, so I can foresee some hurdles that we're going to have to overcome in the near future, but I'm pretty confident of the teams at Cal's between the, all the units that work together, I'm sure we'll overcome it. Okay. Um, so, so for, for, our, for, for ourselves, the, there's been uh, a number of uh, complexities with regards to challenges. Um, so I think the biggest challenge for us has been communication, um, whereas we would be doing it by face-to-face. -face. We're now having to replace that with uh, email, telephone, virtual, and I think we've all been getting used to vir working virtually. Um, you know, so that, that has been a challenge. Um, I think collaboration, um, I think, is restricted under virtual uh, environments. So, you know, where people, uh, we're, when we're trying to get people to have cross inductions uh, into other departments, that's not always worked. Um, you know, kind of orientation and that sense of belonging, uh, you know, uh, you know, when you come into an organization, sometimes you, know, you can get a feel for the organization. But, you know, we really work, want to kind of build on that. Um, and I think the human touch has been lost somewhat with, with regards to moving into a virtual environment. And I, and I think that it was a novelty for a short while and people really enjoyed it. I think the longer we've been in it, uh, the more difficult it's been uh, to engage my new members of staff, for example. Um, you know, I've had a number of people staff within, start within my directorate and I've never met them uh, apart from uh, interview, which was months ago. Uh, and some of them I haven't met at all because it was all done virtually. Um, so trying to get that psychological contract, um, you know, really, really embedded is, is, is quite difficult in that onboarding uh, process because regardless of what people say, you know, people feel a little bit detached because they're not actually physically within a space of a team. So th they've, been, they've been the main challenges, I think, as well as hardware and systems. So I think we were talking about um, setup. So we have uh, invested quite a lot in our staffing, whereby new starters have been offered new laptops, um, uh, contribution towards a desk, um, a chair, and also all the IT peripherals, because we felt that actually, you know, if they were coming into the, the, in the work environment, health and safety is extremely important. So just because they're working at home now, we, we, we can't really forget that duty as an employer as well. So, so there's been those complications to kind of think about, but we are overcoming them. Brilliant, brilliant. And I know we were talking about it earlier. I'm certainly suffering from not having that office chair. I, I'm going to have to go and find one from somewhere. But uh, what I really want to pick up on there is this idea of integration into a, into a company's culture being bonded to and, and, and you called it there um, that, that psychological contract that brings you into an organization and some techniques around that and Andy I wonder and tell me if I've got this completely wrong but is this the time we can talk about Salesforce Awada? We most definitely can Nick so the Salesforce Ohana <laughs> is um, Ohana there you go yeah it's um, it's a concept that comes from Hawaii actually and our CEO Mark Benioff a number of years ago over 20 years ago spent some time whilst he was working for Oracle uh, he had a sabbatical and during that sabbatical he started to think about his career what he wanted to do had visions of this company that we now know as being Salesforce and he I suppose really wanted to pay homage to the fact that a lot of his thinking happened when he was in Hawaii on that sabbatical and in Hawaii, the word Ohana means family. And it's not just family, it is the family that you choose to be part of. And so we talk about that as being um, our, our employees, our customers, our partners, a community that we have called Trailblazers, 
and also our communities as well. And when we talk about our Ohana and the family concept, we're talking about how that we're going to take care of one another. We're going to have each other's backs. We're going to collaborate together. We're going to have fun together. And we have this goal of making the world a better place um, overall at Salesforce as well. So people have a real attachment to that when they first come into the organization. And I think, you know, picking up on what Umar said there around, obviously, the experience being virtual versus, you know, meeting someone in person is very, very different. However, I would say that, you know, people have given us feedback that they have felt so welcomed into the organization. And I think they feel welcomed into the organization by the people that they have experiences with. And so if you have people who are very passionate about your culture, who can talk about the values, who have stories about the values, then, you know, that just exudes from that person. And they pick up on that, I think, you know, to, to maybe a lesser extent than what they would do if I was sat talking to you right now uh, in person. But that's the feedback that we have, that if people are genuinely passionate about what it is that they do and the organization that they're part of, then that comes across whether that is in, in person or in the virtual world. Susan, does that resonate with, with the kind of uh, the way in which you bring people into the organization at, at KAUST, either normally or the way in which you've done it in the digital space? Um, absolutely, same thing. So, so I think um, the technique is we need to ensure that the essential communication tools are there, right? So regardless of, of, of it's a big spectrum, there's a lot of things. We need to make sure um, they are constantly updated on what's going on, what's happening, to feel that they are present, they're with us. So there's the constant updates from senior administration. We need to ensure that there's the one-on-one -on -one meetings or, or um, discussions with key people. So as if we, we have to mimic the actual physical onboarding. So where the faculty member would come and meet with several key players or key people in the universities, such as the VPR, center directors, program chairs, the deans of their divisions. So we need to ensure that the same um, system is gonna be set um, digitally or virtually. And it, it's, it adds a layer of complexity in terms of uh, making standardizing the process across all divisions, across everybody, um, not forgetting anything, and then depending on the personality of the person, how can we facilitate the discussions? How can we ensure that everyone is getting the same fair share? Um, and then, then we run across um, technology and, and, and proper technology. Do they have the right um, uh, internet? Do they have the right laptops? Do they have, you know, are they set up for the online meeting solutions, whether Zoom, Microsoft, whatever they, they have, or their countries allow? Then we run across something like that, right? So it's a bit of a challenging thing, but our job is to basically ensure that essential communication tools are there and we, we need to be flexible to work around whatever's there to make it accessible for them. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, when I first approached you to, to take part in this, you said, great, I've just rewritten our entire onboarding strategy. Did that cultural buy-in play a big part in, in that rewrite? Yeah, um, so, so one of the, the key factors of our onboarding approach is the culture and values piece, uh, which we're really trying to embed. I think, for me, um, your, onbo your onboarding process starts uh, from the time the individual is offered the role. Um, you know, it, for me, it's not about when they land in an organization. Um, so we are doing a lot of work around making sure that um, they feel part of the organization, they're kept in touch with, you know, even to the point of contracts of employment, you know, we have various teams that, that keep in touch with the individuals and then hand over, because I think that that experience is really, really important. For employees to know that they they are uh, you know moving into an organisation that values them, um, you know, and we have done lots of things like um, you know kind of social things which which just welcome them into the organisation. Simple things like quizzes and and those types of things. Um, in terms of in terms of cultures and values, one of the things that is absolutely embedded in what we're trying to achieve is the equality, diversity, and inclusion agenda. 
you know, um, for me, it is really important that we are bringing people into the organization that understand what our value set is around our customer base, if I can put it that way. You know, we have one of the most diverse student bases, you know, in the country, um, you know, and there's a lot of students. Um, so, so, um, so we need to make sure that our staff understand what we are about as an organization, but also how we interact with our, our other colleagues um, where we've got a diverse base of, of staffing as well. Um, so for me, it's about understanding how do you make people feel really welcome and create that sense of belonging. That is so key, I think, in, in, in driving productivity, because if they don't feel as they belong in an organization, they, they, you know, you will not get the best out of these people. And, you know, to make it more complicated, you know, we have people uh, coming to work from from all over the world. So Netherlands, Singapore, um, and, you know, a case study was where we had two people in lockdown who were due to come out and work with us um, from those two countries. So they are actually still where they are, but we have made extra effort to onboard them. Um, and some of them will be flying across soon. So, you know, so, you know, they almost feel as though they know people when they come into the organization, which is extremely important. Mm. And now I'd really like to drill down on that sense of belonging because I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to onboard somebody myself at the moment and due to COVID there's uh, visa delays and all that kind of fun. And, you know, there are th things that we're doing in terms of sharing content, giving, you know, opening up subscriptions to stuff that we're producing, introducing to the, them to people in the organization. But, but how do you drill that? Or do, am I using the right terminology there? Do you drill that into someone or is that actually something that you have to have them accept? Imar, I'll come to you again. Uh, I, I, I think that it's a journey that you have to go on. It's not something, um, you know, you can do in one induction program and expect them to be feeling part of a team. I think it's the interactions they have with the key people. Um, you know, we, we've all been there where, you know, we go to a shop and we have a bad interaction with a, with a particular salesperson or whatever, and you form a view um, it's no different for, for employees. And I think the markets have changed quite drastically whereby, you know, talent out there is difficult to get hold of and keep. You know, it's not, we're not in the same position where we were many years ago where, you know, you get a job and that's it, people stay there for years. So the, the induction part of keeping them feeling as though they're aiming at the right direction for the organisation is really, really important. I, I do stress the EDI bit um, that we do make sure that is absolutely embedded throughout what we do. We can't be an inclusive organization if we don't have people who understand our value set as an organization. So it takes time to answer your question, Nick. It yeah. doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. Always looking for a quick fix, unfortunate. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll stick on the EDI uh, agenda for a small while because, um, I mean, it's something that's come up time and again throughout this mini series that we've been doing. Um, and Andy, I'll come to you because I know you've been doing some work on, on, on EDI as well during, during the lockdown. Uh, what's that meant for Salesforce? In, in the whole equality conversation? Mm. Yeah. Well, equality is one of Salesforce's four core values. So we were starting in some respects from a strong uh, position. And we have a number of different equality groups at Salesforce. Sometimes these would be known as uh, employee resource groups. So these are all employee led. So we have groups such as Bold Force, which is the Black Organization for Leadership and Development. We have the Salesforce Women's Network. We have um, Asia Pack Force. We have Outforce. You know, th there's around 12 of these different groups. And so these are all led by people who are very passionate about those particular themes. And, you know, I think the great thing about it is that people are able to educate one another around these things. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, someone who is in Bold Force, for example, does not have to be black. Anyone can join any of these different groups. And I think, you know, with recent conversations that have happened around Black Lives Matter in particular, you know, from my own personal point of view, this has been a huge learning curve 
um, and I have tried to make myself as vulnerable as possible and admitting that I don't know a lot of things that happen out there. One of the great things that we have uh, done at Salesforce is that we have opened up that conversation. We've not shied away from it. We have senior, our, man, our senior leadership team, our executive leadership team are talking now around how we want to really change that diversity uh, look and feel across our workforce within the next three years. And we give people resources, but we also, I think, have seen a lot of employees really step forward and become ambassadors for and allies, I suppose, to people who are suffering during these times. And, you know, whether it's be people getting together and reviewing I know some people frown upon having book clubs around, you know, how to be an anti-racist and things like that. But for some people, that's just the, that, that's the place where they're currently at and they're, help, they're trying to educate themselves more. Um, and I think people need to understand that and other people perhaps a little bit further down that road in wanting to speak out, in wanting to go to, you know, a march or a protest. I think we're all on that journey at different points. Um, and as long as we all kind of have that, that, that driving factor of one equal workplace, one equal world, um, then hopefully that's, that's where we should be going with it. Yeah. Amar, did the Black Lives Matter movement, has that accelerated things at SHU as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I've been involved in, in race equality for, for many years, but um, I felt that the Black Lives Matter uh, movement it, it, it's it's it feels different i think we you know as 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 institutions as organizations are really embracing it we, we've really embraced it i uh recently for the first time I, I write quite a lot of blogs but the first time i wrote a blog about my experience of racism uh, over the years both in personal setting and a work setting um would i have done that four or five years ago most probably not um, am I, I, do I feel comfortable? Maybe it's where I am in my career. I don't know. Uh, but the organization I'm working for is, is really committed and fantastic about this. Um, we are just, um, tomorrow we are running our first open session on talking about race equality. You know, let's get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, and it is uh, a starting point on people feeling it's okay to talk about difficult issues and it's okay if you get things wrong. You know, yep. it's, it's not about being in an environment where people are lambasted for, for, for saying the wrong word. Um, I think that's completely the wrong approach to it. So we're doing lots of things. One of the other things that we are doing both across for all equality uh, strands, including women, uh, disability, LGBTQ+, uh, um, is um, we are driving recruitment and representation um, and I'm just launching uh, with my uh, teams the first um, BAME, uh, Black Ethnic Minority Leadership Development Program from middle management to the boardroom. Um, and that is something that, um, you know, we are looking to develop in such a way and it's open and you have to apply to go on it. So it's talent management. So um, even new staff that in terms of coming to the organization, when they linking it back to onboarding, when they see that, and they see the organization is doing activities such as this, it makes a huge difference in, in, in linking with sense of belonging. Because, because what they see is the organization making a concerted effort. We've got a long way to go. Um, you know, if we look at board representation, it's still far from acceptable in terms of uh, black and ethnic minority representation. We're getting a lot better with women on boards, which is great, um, you know, and that's really moved along. But the question I kind of leave, put to our listeners is, you know, why do we feel comfortable talking about gender and not race? Because when race is talked about, suddenly we get a lot of people feeling a lot more nervous about that. Now, can we get to a place where gender is? Gender's not made it completely there yet, but actually, you know, we're, we're a lot far ahead on gender. Can we, can, we talk, can we think why that is the case? So that's a question really to the listeners um, to think about. 
Uh, it's, it's a great question, I think. And uh, I'd just say, I, I'm going to bring us slightly, slightly back, uh, although I recognise it's intrinsically linked, EDI yeah, within yeah. the onboarding piece. I'm going to bring us back in a minute. But what I would just say is for those of you who are concerned that equality, diversity and inclusion, that, that whole agenda, or in fact, you know, equality more broadly, is, is not supported by a national framework in the country you're in, I really urge you to go and watch last week's webinar. Uh, where we had Susan Way from NYU Abu Dhabi and Hugh Martin of the British University in Dubai. Uh, and both of them spoke of the, the power of individual institutions and individuals within those institutions yeah. in creating change in that space. Um, I, I, I'm sure Emma would agree with me, although the UK as a country has uh, seems to be much further progressed in these matters. Sometimes, although it seems that way, it doesn't necessarily help the individual institution and you really need to drive it forward um, themselves. So um, we will be sending a link around to that uh, webinar for last week uh, at the end of this. Taking us back a little bit, um, and Susan, I think you've had some experience of this uh, in terms of parity between onboarding physical new staff and digital new ones throughout the pandemic because uh, I think I'm right in saying that there are still core or critical staff or research staff who need to be on campus and need to be in laboratories at this time and how do you ensure that they're getting a parity or that the people you're onboarding digitally get a, a parallel experience to, to them? Subject weigh a lot on this because, as I said, I'm involved in, in faculty onboarding, but from the task forces that I've been sitting on and uh, planning all this thing, um, we at Cal shut down completely, completely the labs. Like, it took us two to three weeks to shut down the labs and send everybody home. And we've recently started opening up in phases, like every other institution. Um, so, of course, phase one meant only the critical staff would go. So it was identifying who the critical staff is. It's a huge undertaking. It's a lot of people involved to identify who should go, what is the critical service, and, and how to, you know, maintain social distancing, maintain health and safety rules or, um, you know, policies that have been uh, adapted in such a quick way. Um, how does it translate to um, online boarding uh, or like how much of it can translate? I'm not sure. They must go hand in hand, but still, it's, 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 there's going to be, we need to do it in, uh, over such a long time. It's going to take, take time. We're not going to be overnight just opening the whole campus and going back. Um, it's the same thing applies to students going back to classes. How are we going to manage that? How are we going to get faculty back to classes? Do the faculty get the choice of going back to class or not? What if they are one of the uh, people with pre-existing conditions and they don't want to be back in, in class? So it's, it's really tough. What we've done recently is we've um, surveyed faculty about the challenges, our current faculty, not the new faculty they're coming, challenges that were faced during the whole thing and the quick move to online learning and all of that, challenges or lessons learned or, or good things. And out of those survey results, we've come uh, a, with several action plans, you know? So we needed, we felt that, okay, our faculty need courses on online design, online course design. They don't know how to move online. How are they gonna design their curriculum online? Or, so we, we are acting in that sense. We basically collated the survey, analyzed them, and we're looking at the gaps to see how we can do that. So of course, a lot of them are talking about their presence in the labs, how we can bring the students back to the labs. There's lots of great um, uh, suggestions. And, you know, we are now breaking into subgroups to see how can we adopt all of that. Well, have you undertaken any similar activity in terms of surveying your, your, your current faculty or indeed incoming faculty and staff? Sorry, Umar, can you hear us? I'm here. you. Can you hear me? We we've got you. Uh, the the question was: Are you um, are you surveying your your current faculty or incoming faculty uh, on uh, on bringing them back onto campus and how they feel about that and, and certain yeah. challenges? Yeah, I can hear you now. Sorry. Yeah, we, we've got a whole program uh, being run by a director of estates and facilities, um, and HR and OD are part of that. Um, it's extremely complex, and 
you know, it's more complex than I thought in terms of bringing people on. I just thought we could switch the lights back on and everybody would go back into the buildings, but clearly it's not as simple as that. Um, so, so hence why I said uh, earlier that I, I, you know, in our conversations that I'll be working at home till at least January, because it's academic uh, colleagues who we need to get in uh, first to make sure we can service our students. Um, and, and, and that I think also has I think that has an impact on mental health, if I'm being honest with you, for all staff, uh, including new staff who, who, who need to feel part of a team. So we have got a plan in place, but it is pretty complex because one of the things that we have had uh, with regards to COVID-19 is um, Sheffield, unfortunately, or one of the 10 cities that are at higher risk of potential lockdown again, uh, if, if it does get to that point, hopefully it doesn't. So we're having to prepare with kind of moving targets uh, with regards to what would happen if, if that was the case. Um, but yeah, we've got a plan in place. H how useful that plan is, depending on whether we have another wave, is, is another story. We've got our first question from the floor, and I'm just going to take this opportunity to say, please, guys, I've seen a couple of people raising hands. Uh, if you could actually but you just press the Q&A button at the bottom, post your question down there and it'll filter through to us. But the first question that we've had is, um, if the COVID-19 crisis continues to affect the ability for face-to-face -face onboarding, are there any additional processes? So I suppose in addition to what you've done so far, that you would like to implement? Um, and uh, Andy, I don't think we've heard from you in, in a short while. Yeah, I think that, that's a great question. And there are, there are definitely some things that we have had to fast track that we were thinking about prior to COVID. Uh, so for example, we, we know that people coming into an organization want to network with other people. We know that they have this, this thirst to hear from executive leadership as well. And so actually one of the great things Umar mentioned earlier in the call around uh, having access to leadership has been great at Salesforce. And I don't know whether this is because these people are not traveling as much, so they're not in airplanes for half of their working day, but we have seen a real rise in having access to executive leadership team to be able to welcome our new, our new people into the organization and to share with them their own experiences and their, their wisdom for how they can be successful in their journey. So I definitely would like to see that continue uh, during the times when we are, are virtual. I think, I think one of the key things for us has been around networking. And so as much as we had a lot of resources online already to help people who were work, we have a big work from home population anyway, but it was a case of how do we help people to connect and not necessarily connect on things to do with Salesforce or to do with work, but how do I connect, create a connection with you over whatever that connection might be and a, and a personal connection. Mm. So one of the first things that we do now when a new employee joins Salesforce is we, we have them join a country specific welcome meeting uh, within their first hour of the company. And during that first half hour, we basically ask them to kind of share a little bit about, you know, where they are, what their role is, what they like to do outside of work, you know, that whole awkward question of a fun fact. And we've had like some amazing connections, some very bizarre connections that people have formed around, you know, 30 people on a call and five of those people all found out that they played ukulele or people had a common connection of having different colored eyes. And I just think it, it's really interesting to watch that dynamic because you can see that once people have find that they have a common, a commonality amongst a couple of other people, that makes them feel really at home. Mm -hmm. And one of the other things that I would really advocate moving forward is how do we create communities within larger communities as well? So for us, as great it is for an executive leader to come in and talk to our new employees around, you know, what they think are some good things to do in their, in their new careers, you know, that person might have been at Salesforce for over 10 years. 
And so their onboarding was never in COVID-19 lockdown. It was in an organization that was a lot small at the time. And so while some of their advice might remain relevant, then some of it might not quite hit home. So what we like to do is to encourage our new employees to try to create communities amongst themselves. So, you know, they are able then to come together in a safe space, not with their manager, for example, and share, I really don't quite understand how this is working. I don't know if I made the right decision. Hopefully no one says that at Salesforce. But it gives them that safe space to really come together and say, oh, I have this really cool experience or I'm really not sure about this. I'm really struggling with this. How are you finding that as well? Um, you know, because to, to Umar's point, a, a new employee joining whatever organization it is, whether it be private, whether it be education, wherever, you know, there's going to be some apprehension in that experience. And when you add in the mix of working in very isolated circumstances, the impact on mental well-being can be significant. So we're looking at ways in how which we can help to facilitate those conversations amongst a number of different people during lockdown. And Susan, the, the, the same question to you. Are there any uh, additional processes you're going to look to implement, either that, that marry with, with Andy's there or, or any of your own? I guess I, I can't think of a specific process that I would like to uh, or, or we have to do, but, but I want to ensure there is engagement, ongoing engagement with the faculty candidates that accepted the offers to keep them engaged and keep them interested. Because the biggest danger is if we lose that connection, they're going to not come in our case, right? So um, whatever it is, I think, and, and uh, we noticed that um, the potential of, of virtual uh, communities and all of that is evolving every day. Like every day we come up with new things and new ideas and we're learning new things and we're learning new reach out methods and I don't know, Zoom parties and like just Andy just shared with us right now. It's like a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? So how can we keep them engaged? So now we are in the process of planning a new faculty orientation. So I need to be super creative on how to design it to keep them engaged. Like I can't have a full day orientation. I need to spread them out throughout a week. I need to have engaging speakers. How am I going to keep them engaged? So this is the main thing. But as I said, we might, you know, every day there's a new thing that comes up and, and we're open to ideas. And Umar, it sounds like uh, you and Andy are certainly on, on the same page. And again, there's some similarities in what Susan's saying. Is there anything additional that you're, you're, you're looking to implement over the next few months? Um, I, I, think, I think the only thing additional that we'd be looking to do is um, think about people's learning and development um, whilst in lockdown, because we've kind of been quite responsive to operational pressures. Um, and I think especially for new starters, you know, them feeling that they're not just 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 working they've got a they've got a they've got a bit of a an opportunity to develop and have some professional development as well um so we are looking at a bit of a strategy a learning and development review on on how we can enable that to happen um post covid because i think it's going to be quite different i think the the other thing uh that i think we are looking to do is really improve our onboarding site and have an app um, being developed, which will which will have be an onboarding app, which will look at really keeping people in touch on their phones. It's it, you know, it's it's so easy just to pick your phone up and press a button for an app rather than going to your email. That actually it it, it means we can keep in instant touch with our new recruits, um, and that's something we are looking to explore. Uh, and we have got our own system currently which we can um, put that live but to do that for 6,000 staff um, across the organization and new starters is going to be challenging. The, the other thing finally is to, to talk about actually that we are not recruiting as much as we were uh, you know during this time um, you know uh, I think that uh, especially with universities until student numbers are, are there you know it's a bit of an uncertain time um, so so we have not has had has have had as much traffic. However, we've had a lot more temporary, um, fixed term type posts and positions, which actually brings a whole host of other onboarding challenges because 
you have to really keep them engaged because they, they're not potentially going to be here for the long term. So how do you do that for you know, somebody remotely who may only be with you for 12 months? You can't, you're never going to get them into that same ingrained culture that you may with a full-time member of staff. So how do you get them working to capacity as quickly as possible and keep them engaged? Yeah. It's a very interesting point. Um, we've got another question here from Adnan uh, Bakatha. And, and thank you, Adnan. I was uh, going to have to resort to asking for fun facts from our panelists. So, uh, so thanks for your question. Um, <laughs> The, uh, Adnan asks, what facilities are being planned to be provided to faculty in order to empower them for online teaching? Of course, we know that all institutions provide Zoom or Teams or another system, but does teaching need more than this? Could you please elaborate on the necessary facilities to have effective and efficient online teaching? Uh, and Susan, I think I'll come to you first on this one. Sure. Um, that's interesting to me because actually we are currently designing um, uh, course offerings with uh, Penn State University and John Hopkins. So as a result of the survey that I mentioned before, we figured out what the gaps are. So the main recurring themes were assessment, online assessment, faculty, our faculty at least who did not do online teaching found it very difficult to switch to online assessment. Like how can I design exams or assignments? one hour of online teaching you need 12 hours of prep at home so that was kind of impossible for the switch move, for the quick switch to online teaching uh, so we immediately we don't have a center for teaching and learning at cows but we immediately went out and reached out to other uh, knowledgeable people in this domain like faculty who have been teaching online and directs the way right and we uh, quickly designed a set of courses, just-in-time courses, to quickly assess, uh, assist our faculty and time for them to be prepared to, for September. We've also put together a list of online courses that other platforms are offering, like Coursera, um, Educause, all of this, um, you know, all these, like everyone is now on it. So we've also uh, collated a catalog for our faculty to look through them in case they want to go and do it personally themselves at their own time. But, um, and we have the uh, option or they have the option to consult with, um, you know, professionals on how to do a specific thing, like how am I going to redesign my curriculum or how am I going to redesign the course that I'm going to offer. So this is how we can help our faculty and this is what we've resorted to. Excellent. And Omar, is that similar to the work that's going on at SHU? Yeah, we've got a, a lot of work happening with academic colleagues in terms of getting ready for autumn delivery. Um, I think the, the, the challenge here is that, you know, that our, you know some, some colleagues are very good at technical um, kind of abilities and online and, and, and some not so good. And, you know, that's, that's you know, um, dependent on how, how used to you've been to, 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 to doing this type of stuff. The, the other thing that we have looked at, obviously, is the recording of lectures um, to make sure that, you know, people can get access to those. Again, that's a, that's not a new phenomenon, but, but actually, you know, uh, in the current context of it, that's new for, for a lot of people. Um, and then the, the, the other thing is, how do we make online teaching really interesting rather than just developing a PowerPoint and sticking it on? A Zoom meeting, you know, um, you know, we've got to make sure that our students are getting a really good student experience. And part of the, the the beauty of coming to university is you have that human interaction, you discuss, debate, and so on. Um, so we've got to start to think outside the box. We do use Blackboard, um, you know, in terms of trying to look at online materials uh, within within the, the university. But I think this is going to be a learning curve. This is this is going to be the first time we've done full online, you know, compared to something like the Open University in the UK, which are which are fully online, uh, you know. So so um, I think there's a little bit of a, a balance between staff skills, uh, technical skills, and ability to be able to deliver, um, you know, effectively for the students. And at the end of the day, it's the evaluation from the students that come back which tell the story. Yeah, yeah. And we certainly, you know, we heard 
in our first webinar of this series around recruitment that universities are now looking for those looking for those skills in the people that they're bringing in you know okay are you proficient in online teaching or are you actually a blended learning or online learning specialist and i think that'll be really interesting as this goes on to see just how prized and how premium those uh, those members of faculty become um a quick answer to, to one question yes we will be sharing the uh, recording of this afterwards so don't worry if you've missed anything um and we've got a couple of minutes left so i'm going to throw one final question uh, out to you guys from this myriad list um we all seem to be working longer we all seem to be working harder what is the everyone's getting back pains from being on too many zoom calls and sitting in the wrong chair what's your one piece of kind of personal advice to the people that you are onboarding the people you're bringing into your organization uh, throughout this time uh, and, and Susan, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you first. <laughs> Organization, you know, like setting priorities, um, um, differentiating um, my personal life from my work life, even if I am in the same environment physically, uh, is a huge thing. It, it takes a lot of practice and a lot of um, discipline to be so, but um, but it can be done. You just have to be disciplined to do it. So you just say, you know, I have eight hours and I need to stop, disconnect, attend to my family or to my personal life, and then um, this this you know find the balance. Andy, um, I really want you to share your your uh, ironing board trick. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna send it over to you with that message. Well, yeah, that, I was going to answer, it was going to be on a physical stroke mental theme. And so I, I was inspired by someone who worked in our Dublin um, office who had shared a picture of themselves sitting on their sofa with an ironing board as their temporary desk. And so I thought we could perhaps innovate on that idea and we could use the ironing board as a standing desk. So you know, every hour or so, perhaps switch up from sitting behind your desk or sitting behind your ironing board on your sofa and stand up and uh, stretch those legs out as well. And on top of that, I would just advocate that people try to get outside as much as they can, you know, to take walking meetings and to to think about the, the things that are on their agenda instead of being in front of a laptop. And Emma, finally to you. Uh, I think, um, you know, colleagues have covered uh, majority of things. I think I would I would really say look after your mental health. Um, this is this this uh, period of COVID, um, and especially in terms of what Su Su Susan was saying, in terms of the the, the the break between work life and home life. Um, you know, it's really important to take care of your mental health in this time. Have some downtime because uh, it's quite difficult to switch off because it very quickly can creep up on you. Um, you know, in terms of thinking, why am I snapping at this person? You know, I'm, I've been all right all day, but actually, you, it's it, it's str the stress does manifest itself if you're constantly in front of a screen. And I also think that the fact that we're not used to sitting down and looking at a screen all day, I think we're going to have a lot more people potentially <laughs> needing glasses at the end of COVID nineteen. I think uh, you know, so try and try and look after yourself. That's my main thing. Brilliant. Well, look, we, we're out of time, but to my panelists and my Andy and Susan, thank you so much for, for taking